start. Good morning, everyone. So for, for today's tutorial talk, it's a pleasure to have Ahmed uh, Alawi, um, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Statistics and Data Science at Cornell University. And he's going to talk about uh, methods from statistical physics. Thank you, Yontard. Um, yeah, thank you to the organizer for, for organizing this. And it's always really nice to go back to Berkeley. I did my grad school here and I have fond memories being in this audience. Um, yeah, so I was asked to give a tutorial about methods from statistical physics, and I didn't know what to talk about. And now that I spend a few days with you guys, now I know a bit better what could be interesting to this audience. Um, so I'll be focusing, as here the second bullet says, on statistical inference. So um, the main uh, goal here is to introduce the notions that are mostly used and the techniques that are mostly used in stat phase to address this type of questions that are relevant to statistical inference. And um, I'll be proceeding with very specific models. I'm not gonna claim any generality in this field. It is almost useless to try to formulate a general theory. So I'll just be considering very specific models and I'll be studying them. And um, the tools that are used are generalizable. You just have to change them depending on the, the kind of models that you're looking at. But the main ideas are still the same. Okay, so perhaps I should give an outline for this first lecture. I'll be introducing Gibbs measures. And so these are posterior measures because I'll only be looking at statistical inference. These are really posterior measures of statistical models. I'll introduce the free energy, the partition function, look at the derivatives of those, and I'll introduce perhaps one model where we can see a phase transition. Um, and I'll talk about the Gaussian additive model. This is the model that we're gonna be mostly looking at. And perhaps, Depending on where we end, I'll talk about the spiked matrix model, which is a special special case of the Gaussian additive model. Okay, so let me start jumping right in. Um, so let's start in one dimension. I'm going to start with the Gaussian additive model, and then I'll define all of these things within the, this Gaussian additive model. Or let me just write GAM instead of keeping. So here we have a signal, signal random variable that is drawn from some prior P0. This is in R. So this then is just a real number. And we're going to draw a Gaussian that is independent from X0. And then we're going to observe a, a number Y that could be written as square root lambda times x0 plus z, right? Where lambda is a fixed constant. So you observe y, and you would like to understand what's going on with x0, right? So I can try to look at the distribution. So what is, first of all, what is the density of y in given x0? So this is just a Gaussian density, because this is a Gaussian, right? So you get... Right, so that's the density. Now, if you use the Bayes rule, I'll try to get the posterior measure of x0 given y. Right. So there's a normalization constant that I'm going to call z. So if you use the Bayes, the Bayes rule, you get exponential the same thing. And if I start uh, removing the things that don't matter, so here I only care about x0, so the y is a constant, it's going to go away. What's going to matter is the square of this and the cross product, right? So there's a plus here, I get square root lambda y x0 minus lambda over 2 x0 squared. The prior is dp0 of x0, right? Now z is whatever normalizing constant will make this integrate to 1, right? So more explicitly, z is the integral of that. OK, 
Okay, so this is called the partition function of the model. This is a Gibbs measure, or the posterior measure in particular. And here we have a very specific function in the exponential, which is given by this model, just follows from, from the definition of this model, but you could have any function here. So perhaps call it f of x, right? x zero. So this is called the Hamiltonian. This is called the partition function. And you may notice here that this Hamiltonian depends on y, which is a random variable, right? So this whole measure is itself random, right? And this partition function is itself random. Now, if I take the logarithm of z and take an expectation in front, I'm going to call that f of lambda. Function of lambda and y to make things explicit. Right? So here I'm taking an expectation over y. So this is a deterministic function of lambda that's called the free energy, right? Are there any questions so far? Yeah. Lambda is a, a signal to noise ratio, let's say. So it's just a constant that multiplies the signal x zero. If it's big, then estimation or, you know, it, the model gives you a lot of information about x zero, what x zero is. But if lambda is small, then it doesn't give you much information. It's just like a tune in parameter. Yeah. Yeah. So the Hamiltonian is this thing, right? This particular thing, right? And just for notation, I will, whenever I integrate with respect to x0, I'm just going to drop the not subscript, OK, to distinguish it from the actual x0 that enters the definition of y. So OK. Right. This is all fine, right? Whenever I integrate with respect to x, I'll just write x. OK. Yeah. Uh, so is this partition? So the free energy is now just dependent on this partition function. Is this like, so you lose some dependence on the, uh, on like that distribution you're right up there, right? Because now it's only dependent on this integral over that distribution. So this thing a priori has all the information, most of the information you need to reconstruct the behavior of this. So yeah, so good question. This function is, you can think of it as some kind of cumulative generating function. So, you know, the moment generating function, the logarithm of that is the cumulative generating function. And it contains a lot of the information you would like to understand about this posterior measure. So, in principle, you don't lose anything. So, okay. Other questions? Okay, so another uh, object here is the posterior mean. So, if I look at the mean vector of this, uh, of this posterior measure, let me call it m hat. And m hat will depend on y, right? So that's just the expectation of x given y, right? And if you're a Bayesian and you would like to minimize the mean squared error, so I give you y and I ask you to compute an estimate of x, and you're doing just minimum uh, minimum mean squared. You're trying to minimize the mean squared error, then this is the minimizer, right? So if you look at the MMSE, which is Minimum over all estimators theta hats of the square uh, distance between x0 and theta hat of y, right? So the minimizer, minimizer is just the this, and then this becomes the expectation of x0 minus. Right? And notice that this also only depends on lambda. So I want to now introduce something that is very specific to statistical models, which is called uh, well, the Bayes rule, or sometimes it's also called the Nishimori property. The name comes from a different um, Interpretation. It didn't, they didn't, people did not realize it was the Bayes rule when they discovered this. So the experiment is as follows. So generate x0, like I said here, from p0, then 
generate y according to that model. Uh, now draw x1, x2, dot 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 xn, iid from the posterior. Right? Given y. Now I want to understand the following expectation. So I look at the expectation of a function phi of x1, x2, dot, dot, dot y. And uh, let's write x0 before y. xn, x0, and y. Right? So if I condition on y, these are independent. So all ten given y, right? So these guys only depend on y. When you condition on them, they're independent and they're fixed. The only thing that is random now is x zero, but the distribution of x zero given y is x zero given y has the same distribution as any of these, right? So I can also write x one, x two. Okay, let me write it. X n, x zero, y. That's also as I said. The expectation of x1, x2, dot, dot, dot xn, xn plus one, y, right? This is a two. So this is just by the Bayes rule, right? So this planted signal acts as another draw from the posterior when you look at averages of this form, right? In particular, if you just look at, in particular, if you look at x1, x2 so these this is a draw this, these are two uh, draws from from the posterior and probably in distribution it's the same thing as looking at x0 x1 so this is a fundamental property for, for statistical models um, in this in this theory we'll see that's going to be useful in some of the computations we're going to do Right, so now that we've defined all of this, I can look at derivatives of the free energy. Uh, perhaps some other lemma that I'm going to use. So lemma, this is Gaussian integration by parts. That's going to be useful in what I'm going to say. You know that if you have a Gaussian random variable and you look at the expectation of z times f of z where z where f is a differentiable function such that this expectation makes sense say that f has almost uh, at most polynomial growth then this is also the same thing as the expectation of f prime right so this is just by integration by parts now let me look at the derivatives of f these are fundamental objects. If I look at the first derivative, so that's the derivative of this thing. So you see here, z depends on y. Uh, z depends on lambda, excuse me, also on y, of course. And But y also depends on lambda. So I would have to expand this expression in here so that I get a full dependence on lambda, right? So let me write that. So the expectation here will be over x0 and z, logarithm. And then if I expand the expression of y, I get square root lambda z x plus lambda x0 x minus lambda this. Right, and now you see why I removed the knots from from this from this expression is that now I have an x zero on x. Right. So if I take a derivative, so I get it's a logarithm. So I get a ratio 
Ah, I didn't introduce this. Okay, I'll introduce that. So if I take a derivative, I get what? I get the x plus x zero x minus x squared over two exponential f. This is f. over exponential f. Okay. Now I'm gonna keep this term as it is. I'll keep this term as it is. And I'm gonna look at this term. This term has a Gaussian in it. So I'll pull that Gaussian outside and I'm gonna use this lemma. So. And okay, so to simplify notation here, instead of keep writing ratios like this, I'll define the Gibbs average to be that. Okay, so this is called the Gibbs average. Now, if I look at that first term, so we have one over two squared lambda, expectation z x. So this is what that is in this notation. So z can be taken outside here. And this whole function is a function of z. So this is one over two squared lambda, expectation d over dz of this thing by that lemma. So now if you take a derivative of this thing, so I have to differentiate upstairs and downstairs. When you differentiate with respect to Z, then you have a square root lambda X that falls off. So the square root lambda will go with the square root lambda. I get one half, but then when the X falls off in the numerator, I guess you get an X squared. By the way, let me know if uh, you can go down with the camera. And then if I differentiate the denominator, I get an this times the same thing, which is this, right? This is just the rule, right? Stop me if you don't understand the computation. Okay, so now what is the derivative? Yes, correct. That's correct. That's correct. So what is f prime? I dealt with this term and gives me this. Good, and I have these two terms. So I have plus uh, expectations outside, of course. Everything is an expectation. I have this term, which is x zero x. And then I have this term. This one half. Right? So this one will go away with this one. And I have this and that, right? So I have zero x minus one half. These two things are equal, right? So this is just half of whether whether any any of those two. But let me just write it like this, right? So the derivative of the free energy will give you a quantity that. So what is again? Let me. Write this a bit more explicitly. This gives this uh, gives average is the posterior mean, as you know, that you observed, right? And this is the same thing as that. So the derivative will tell you information about the magnitude of the or the second moment of the the, the posterior mean. And if I try to do this computation in more than one dimension, so everything here is one dimensional, but you can look at a model in n dimensions, right? So a vector y and a vector z and a vector x zero, 
Here you can do the same computation, except you have inner products everywhere. This is a norm, inner products, everything works out, and this becomes a two norm. Now, if I look at the second derivative, I will not go through the computation again. Perhaps this is an exercise. So I try to do the same computation, a bit more involved and has more terms in it. But then what you would get is the expectation of the covariance or the variance, I mean, one dimension, the variance of x given y. Uh, squared, perhaps it is squared. Yes. Right, so the same type of computation will give you this. And if I was in more than one dimension, the variance becomes covariance. And then, so since that's a matrix, you take the Frobenius norm. Right. Now, these computations are not difficult to do, but they're, they're fundamental. Like most of the, why you want to compute free energies, like you can ask, why do we care about free energies is precisely because you can compute this quantity and this quantity. So these are the first two cumulants, right? So perhaps let me introduce uh, one other object, which is called the mutual information. I'm gonna have to start going a bit faster at some point. So between two random variables, X and Y, is, I mean, you probably know this. So this is the KL divergence between the joint distribution and the products of the marginals. So if I apply this to my problem, so if this is X zero and this is Y, so what do I get? I get the expectation. So I'm just writing the, Definition of KL of P XY PX PY, right? And this is expectation logarithm. So now let me look at decompose this as Y given X, X given Y, excuse me, times P of Y, right? So P of Y goes away with P of Y. And Px is just P0, right? And then I have a X and a Y here. So I just erased what this is. It was in one of the boards here. If you take the density of the posterior with respect to the to the prior, you get the exponential F over Z, right? Exponential. Let me just write after that. Oh, I'm going to need the expression actually. Right over Z. Now, okay, so you do the computation. So the log will go with the exponential. You compute the expectation of this 10, and you will get one half the expectation of x squared minus expectation log Z, that's F. Right? So you just get the second moment, half of the second moment minus the free energy. So the mutual information and the free energy are the same thing. Right? And this gives you an information, what is the, if I observe Y, how much information do I have about X zero? So now that we've computed the derivative of F, the derivative of, I think there should be a lambda somewhere. I think this should be a lambda here. Zero. Lambda, lambda over two, is that correct? Lambda over two. Right. So if I take a derivative with respect to lambda of this quantity, I get one half this minus the derivative. We computed the derivative. Right. 
minus the derivative is this. So do you recognize this expression? Perhaps with the, uh, you try to uh, expand the squares of something, you get this. So the MMSC, nice. You get half the MMSC. So this is a famous relation in information theory. It's called the IMMSC theorem, right? Um, so this is a simple derivation of the IMMSC theorem. So you have these relationships. If you can compute the mutual information or the free energy, you can compute the MMSC, you can compute this quantity, which are basically the same thing. So that's one of the main interests of doing this, right? So computing, computing F, is the same thing as computing an MSC through a derivative, right? So if you take a derivative, you get that. And a lot of the proofs in this area are of the form, if you want to compute F, you try to compute the MMSC, so you're gonna have to come up with the optimal estimator and then integrate that with respect to lambda, you get a function of, you get an expression of F and vice versa. If you want to compute the MMSC, you compute this, you get a limiting expression, you take a derivative, you get this, right? Okay. So now we're going to see a phase transition. So you see here, I did everything in one dimension. Everything's univariance. There is no possible phase transition that could happen. You're in one dimension. Right? There's nothing that could happen. But now I'm going to look at a multidimensional problem. And it's a simple one. It's the Gaussian mean location problem. Gaussian. So here I'm gonna draw my signal. I'm gonna call it Sigma. This is drawn uniformly from the set one up to two to the power n. So it's an index, it's an integer that is drawn uniformly. And I'll observe y, which is a vector in this many dimensions. It's lambda square root n. This is a scaling that will make sense to you. Also, I'll, I'll talk about that more. And I'll just put this much mass in the coordinates sigma. Right. And then I'll add a Gaussian. So we have a bunch of Gaussians. You have a vector of size two to the power n. All of them are IID Gaussians, except one of them that is elevated by this much. Right. Now we observe y, and I ask you to locate the index where that has that elevated mean. Right. So this is a classical problem. This is a very very simple version of that problem in statistics. Right. So what would you do if I give you this problem? You just put them here and then you have, so how to locate this guy? Something very simple. Yeah, just look at the maximum, right? So if I look at the maximum coordinates and I return that as an estimator, so that's the maximum likelihood estimator. And we can try to analyze um, the performance of that estimator, right? So if you look at this Gaussian vector, it has size two to the power n, right? What is the maximum entry of this of this Gaussian vector? Over i z i, well, it concentrates very tightly around the the quantity that we expect. So this is uh, try to make it a bit more. So it's square root two log the dimension. Right. And that's square root two log two. So you perhaps see why I put a lambda square root n here. If lambda is greater than two square root two, two log two, excuse me, 
then you're going to see it, right? If it's smaller, then it gets drowned in the noise. Right. So F, okay, MLE will work. MLE works with high probability. If and only F lambda is greater than two log two. Yes. But this is probably, okay, I don't know a priori that this is the best estimator, right? So can you come up with a better estimator? Better, I mean, can you lower this value and you can still succeed? So I try to do this, I need to understand the fundamental limits of this problem. And I can try to compute the free energy. So I told you, if you want to compute the MMSC, you can compute the free energy. All right, so let's compute the free energy. So this is, um, let me redefine it. I need to divide by N in the definition. So the free energy, I'll divide by N, and then I'll take the same expression as before. So in our particular case, what is that integral dp0, et cetera? So I'm looking just at a uniform prior and I'm summing over all indices, right? And I have that exponential that shows up here, square root lambda n, y times e0, e, excuse me, e sigma. So that give you y sigma minus, I had a minus lambda over two x squared. And I told you if you're in high dimension, we just put a two norm here and X is E zero. So this is one. So I just get Lambda N over two. Okay. I'm a little confused on the problem setup. Are you trying to find the value or the index? The index, you know the value. Well, you don't know the value. You, I'm trying to find the index. Okay. So when you know Lambda, you know N, you don't, under, you don't observe Z. How could you ever do that efficiently when you have two to the N? No, let's say n is 10. Uh, it's not. Uh, oh, like fix n. Yeah. We're going to let n go to infinity, but this is just for, for, oh. for show. That, I mean, just call 2 to the power on n, call it m, and then I only care about m instead of n. All right, so with this definition, I have the following results. So the strain energy will converge to a function. That looks like this. If lambda greater than two log two, zero otherwise. So it looks like this. So this is lambda c, two log two, and zero up here, and then it's just a linear function. So I'll prove this a bit later, it's not hard. Now, what can you deduce from this? I have a function that converges pointwise to another function as n goes to infinity. Right. I also computed the derivatives of this. The derivative of this is, I erased it. It's one half the expectation of, uh, Zero mean, which is e sigma given y. But okay, so I computed the derivative and I have pointwise converges of this function. But if a function converges pointwise, it doesn't mean that the derivative converges, right? But here the function is convex. So we computed the second derivative and it was positive, right? And then you can still do this now. So there is a theorem in analysis. F, Fn is convex. And Fn converges to F pointwise. Then F, the limit, is convex. If it's convex, it'll be differentiable almost everywhere. It's going to be actually differentiable everywhere except countably on countably many points. So let's just say differentiable almost everywhere. 
almost everywhere. And f prime of lambda will converge to f, and prime will converge to f prime for all lambda at which um, f is differentiable. So we'll look at all the points in which f has a derivative, then this holds. So I can try to apply this to this. Now, what is the derivative of the limiting function? Uh, derivative of the limiting function. One half and zero. So this function is differentiable everywhere except on the critical point, right? So that means that f prime of lambda will converge to this derivative for all lambda not lambda c, right? All right, great. Now we computed an expression of this guy. So what is the MMSC? MMSC and lambda. So from the expression of the mutual information, that was the derivative, twice the derivative. I took zero y. And I can try to write this in terms of the free energy. So we did that and we had, uh, Zero minus. So we, there was a two here and there was a one half here. Right? So this is one. This is x is e sub sigma. So this is always norm one. So I get one minus two. Right? Okay, so now from this, we can deduce what the MMSC is. That's the MMSC will be now. So if this is one half, this is zero. And if this is zero, this is one. Well, so we completely characterize the, the limits of estimation for this problem. Right? So either, either you get it and maximum likelihood will get it for you in this regime or maximum likelihood will not get it in which case nothing gets it. Okay, so this is a phase transition and the phase transition shows up just in the critical point here. So if you have a, so this is a, what the physicist Aaron Fest gave as a definition of a phase transition. You look at the free energy, you look at the limit of the free energy, the thermodynamic limit of the free energy. And if it's non-analytic at a certain point, you say that there is a phase transition. So phase transitions are points where the, the limiting function of the free energy, limit, the limit of the free energy is non-analytic. And this is a kink here, so it's not analytic here. That's the only phase transition we have in this problem. Right. Awesome. Uh, can you make calculations there? So expecting x squared, uh, you're taking the derivative outside. So the derivative of this, e, i, Right, and i is this. I just replaced i, but what it is. So once you take the derivative, uh, uh, there's, a there's a lambda. I always forget the lambda. Ah, okay. Thank you. I always forget the lambda. Yeah. Other questions? So uh, this is, so this shows that the phase transition happens at this lambda. Yeah. Um, does this mean that uh, you got the same transition happening when you took the maximum? Uh, Maximum likelihood estimate. So that says that the maximum likelihood estimate is the best estimate. Exactly. Yeah, that's not always true. in this particular example. It is. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So you're not using the concentration at all of these ZIs to their ex the max of the ZIs to their expectation. So 
Because like if you were at exactly lambda equals two log two, then maybe like half the time you'd be able to tell. Right. All right. So I did not look at what happens at the critical point. That's much more difficult. So you're going to have to go into more details. You're going to have to zoom in, in in the problem and look at more details of what's happening. But like let's say you were at like two log two, like plus like lambda plus like a delta that's like really really tiny. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Near critical phenomena are more difficult to okay. understand. Yeah. That's the same thing. All right. That's, uh, you know, there was a field smell this year about that kind of thing. Of course, not for the field mean, mean location problem. <laughs> uh, yeah, so for what says, for what says the model uh, used for, for, like for more complicated? Uh, yeah, we'll see a more complicated, I don't know about how complicated you can get. So I'll try in the last lecture, I'll try to tie this with deep nuts so we can, if you have time. But you can go relatively complicated. Yeah. Because following up, and sorry, these are like annoying questions. No, but like no, no. <laughs> around, like, is there something that can look non non analytic like this when you don't worry about concentration at all? But then when you think about concentration, like things are actually like smooth but very very sharp. Correct. Yeah. So there are many problems where at this scale of the problem, at scale n of the problem, you see a kink, you see a phase transition, but you would like to zoom in what's going on exactly at that at that phase transition. So there could be a window. Where things are smooth, but the window is sublinear. So when you divide by n, things shrink out. Gotcha. Uh, like an example of a problem like this. So there's okay. Let's talk about this offline. Okay. Right now. That's <laughs> I'm gonna go a lot uh, off topic. Oops. Yeah. Ah, so I didn't prove, okay, perhaps I'll prove this, this formula and then we'll go to the next lecture afterwards. So how do you prove this? Um, I want to introduce this because it's very useful. So this is either called the moments method or maybe just Jensen's inequality in this case. And we're gonna see some interesting phenomena that happen. So my Fn, F lambda, one over N expectation logarithm. So that's my expression. And I want to understand what this, what's going on here. I want to compute a limit. So we can see that, so there's an expectation and a logarithm. If you want to obtain an upper bound, you can use Jensen's inequality and put the expectation inside. If I put this whole expectation inside, whatever this is, this is called the annealed free energy. This is just a name, annealed free energy. All right, let me not do that. I'm not, I'm not gonna put the entire expectation inside. I'm gonna put a conditional expectation inside. So what I'm gonna condition on, so the randomness comes from Y, correct? In this, in this whole thing, the only thing that is random is Y. I'm gonna condition on the location of the actual mean, the actual elevation, right? And the noise that is that accompanies that, right? I'm gonna condition on these two variables. And then I use Jensen. So Jensen. Expectation of this whole thing, but given these two guys. So what is that? So if I condition on these two guys, I have still to the power n minus one terms that are independent. They don't care about what's going on here and I can just hit them with an expectation. So if you hit this with an expectation, if this is not sigma zero, so this is just this, if sigma is not sigma zero, Right. This is a Gaussian, you had this, so this is the moment generating of the Gaussian, it's one, right? This is normalized by this, it's one. So I get this times to the power n minus one times one. And then I get the term that I did not consider in the expectation, which would be just uh, sort of lambda n, y sigma naught minus lambda n over two. So let me expand this guy. So I get Z sigma naught plus this times the same thing, which is to remove the square root, right? 
lambda n minus lambda n over two, and that gives me just lambda n over two. So well, let me expand this. So I get one minus plus this, right? I write this as exponential square root lambda n plus lambda n over two. I had a two to the power minus n here. I'm just going to put it here. So perhaps you see the lambda over two minus log two, which is going to show up, right? So if lambda is positive, like if lambda is positive, then this is lambda is positive. If lambda is greater than Two, two log two, this thing is positive and it's uh, uh, linear in n, so this is exponentially large. So this term will go away, it just depends on square root n, this is linear in n, so I can just ignore this, right? So I can ignore this, I can ignore this, then you have the logarithm, I can ignore this, the logarithm will hit this, then you have an n and n here, it's gonna go away with the n, I get this, right? And over two minus log two. Lambda greater than lambda c. If this is negative, which means that lambda is smaller than lambda c, this is negative, so this whole thing goes away. This goes away, log of one is zero. Otherwise, right? So in order to do this computation, you have to know what to condition on, right? And I just came up with this. I didn't tell you why I did it, right? So now let's just not do this and just push, push the entire expectation inside. So what do we get? Do we get the right answer or do we get some other answer? So let's do that. All right, so let's compute the annealed free energy. So the annealed, as I said, is just uh, Jensen, full Jensen. That whole thing. So you get the same, the two to the power n minus one terms are still the same. When you hit them with an expectation, you get, uh, you get one. And the next term that you're gonna have to care about is this one. So I put an expectation here, right? An expectation here, the only thing that is random is Z. Z is a Gaussian. So I get when I hit that on an expectation, I get exponential. Let me remove the expectation. Lambda n over two. And then this is, uh, you can add, add stuff up like this, right? So I get an additional lambda over two times n that I didn't have because of the square root here, right? So at the end, I get one minus two to the power of minus n. It's really the same thing, right? Plus exponential lambda n minus uh, n log two. Right. Now you see that this, okay, so this is, you don't have to explain too much here. This is lambda minus log two. If lambda greater than log two, zero otherwise. Right. That function is strictly uh, bigger than this one, right? So that function is this. lambda. Okay, they don't have the same slope. This is a higher slope. So it's an upper bound that works here, but that doesn't work here. Log two, right? And so you can ask why. Well, why is this the case? When I push the expectation inside, I get the wrong answer. Well, it's because typically the partition function doesn't concentrate. Right? So the partition function fluctuates widely. It fluctuates as an exponential scale, typically. And this is a pervasive phenomenon in all models of statistical physics. In the cases, like it is rare that the partition function doesn't fluctuate too much. And those are cases of very specific interest. So like we like those cases when the partition function doesn't fluctuate too much. 
Now, if you know that your partition function doesn't fluctuates a lot, and then when you hit it with an expectation, it gives you the wrong answer, you can ask, what is responsible for this? What events, what atypical event is going on here that makes my partition function blow up? Right? And you can try to condition away that event so that once you condition it away, you get something that behaves well, right? So I claim that, that that event is this. I mean, it's not an event, it's a random variable, right? So once I condition on this, everything becomes tame. But if I don't condition on this, things blow up, right? So if you want to be a little bit more precise with this uh, intuition, I can consider the following sequence of events. I'm gonna index them by a parameter tau. And my event will be just that sigma uh, z sub sigma zero is greater than square root tau, tau times n. For some tau that I'm gonna choose later, right? Okay, this is my event. This is a univariate Gaussian. This is something that blows up square root n, right? So this event has very small probability. Yes. Very much. Oh, very, very there's right. no principle there. Yeah. That's an arts. You're, okay. you're gonna have to look at the model. You're gonna have to understand what's going on in your model and then come up with something. Yeah. Also, you're, you still had an upper bound, but that you know that it's equal because the MLE goes. Oh, okay, I forgot. I completely forgot to do the, the lower bound. Um, yeah, sorry. Excuse me. This is just an upper bound. What tells me that this is the exact answer? You can do a lower bound. And the lower bound, I'll just do one line. If n of lambda greater than what? I'll cancel out, I'll forget about all of these, all of everybody in the sum except these, except the term that contributes to the signal. So I would say 1 over n log. Thank you, Lina Greek. I completely forgot. And I'll put a sigma zero here. Lambda n sigma zero minus lambda n. Okay, if you do the computation here, you'll see that you get the same answer. Okay, let me not do it. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you. So if I consider the sequence of events, then the probability of e tau is very small. So this is a Gaussian, you get the Gaussian sub Gaussian tail minus tail n over two. So this is an exponentially small, exponentially rare event, but when it happens, it contributes in an outsized way to the, to the partition function. When this event happens, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, it'll blows up the partition function. Okay, so how do you see that? Excuse me. So I can, before computing the expectation, suppose I didn't know how to compute the expectation of Z based on this observation, I can, just based on this observation without computing anything, I can deduce that the expectation of Z cannot possibly, you know, the nil free energy cannot possibly be the, the quenched free energy. So expectation of Z is always larger than the expectation of Z given that event times the probability of that event, right? because this is positive, right? I can just lower bound it this way. I know this, it's that. Now what is the expectation of Z given this? So Z is this. Now this event only deals with this random variable and the rest of them, since they're IID, you just hit them with an expectation and you get this term, right? Now, the only thing that's gonna matter for, for that computation is this, right? So this is greater than one minus this plus this term, but then I know that this is large. So I'll just lower bound the, that conditional expectation, but whatever I lower bounded Z by. Square root lambda tau n plus lambda n over two minus log two. Okay. So I'll forget about this term. I'll forget about this term. So this is exponentially large. So these terms do not matter. 
but to just say that you're larger than this thing. So this is larger than exponential spirit lambda tau n plus n times what is this function is phi f star lambda. Right. Now z is larger than. You're going to have to multiply by this. So I get exponential. Let me start with this guy. OK, exponential lambda tau square root minus tau over 2. OK, so the expectation of z is what it should be, which is this is the correct answer. I mean, not the correct answer for z, but the correct answer for the free energy times this term. So now I can choose tau to be small enough for this to be positive, right? If tau is smaller than for lambda, for lambda, then this thing is positive, right? So it's exponentially larger. So now you see that the expectation of z is much, much larger than exponential uh, expectation of the logarithm of C, right? So by a exponentially large factor in this, in this case. So you can attribute the blow up of the partition function to a particular family of events, which is this one. And it turns out that if you condition them away, then you get equality if you condition the stuff away. If you condition the right thing, right? Which I did there. Are there questions here? So this happens all the time. This happens, for instance, in random SATs. It happens in spin glass models in low temperature. It happens even in high temperature for models that are not symmetric. It happens all the time. So this is a pervasive phenomenon. So the point of this was to show you that you're going to have to understand the properties of your model if you're trying to compute the free energy, if the expectation of Z just blows up. You're going to have to really understand what's going on in order to make things work, and you not we don't know how to do that always. How much time do I have? Okay, almost. Um, other questions? Perhaps this is a natural way to a natural point to stop. Let me tell you what I'm going to talk about next in the next lecture. I'll go to the one model that is slightly more involved which is the spike Twigner model. So this is the model where you observe a matrix now and the signal vector, it's not a vector anymore, it's a rank one matrix and you add Gaussian, a Gaussian matrix to it. And you can try to ask the same questions. Can I compute the free energy? What is the limits, the fundamental limits of estimating the spike? This is called the spike. And uh, we're gonna see some tools, more tools. And then we're gonna ask about algorithms. How do you figure out what the spike is? Once you know that it is possible to estimate it, what can you do? So I'll talk about AMP, okay? So I'll stop here, thank you. Right, uh, right, right.